me silence my phone. If you remember last time, uh, my aim was to change the way that the gestures were handled to allow shooting without aiming and that sort of thing. And um, when we left on Thursday, uh, it was going haywire. All right, it, it wasn't aiming correctly and so on. And it was actually pretty quick to solve. Let me just show you what I did incorrectly. And we can finish this and maybe play around a bit more with it before we go on to our next topics. So, if we look at the cannon, Let's see, where was it? So I broke down the one function into two functions. I had the fire cannonball and I had a determine angle. In the determine angle, I changed it to accept an argument of a point and I use that instead of um, the, the barrel end because I wanted to um, make it more, um, ma make the function more flexible. So it could be called for uh, either from a point on the screen or from the barrel end depending if I was shooting or aiming. And the problem was is that I forgot to change this reference. I believe it was that reference. Um, it was either this one or this one. I forgot to change. No, it was definitely this one because it was on, the problem was is on the lower half of the screen. When I touched the lower half of the screen, it didn't name it correctly. Um, this brings in a interesting point, and, and you know, like I've said a, a number of times before. Um, One of, one of my jobs and one of your jobs in this class is to take the specific cases and, and think in more general terms about them. Like it's one thing, okay, now we know how to aim the, camera, uh, the, the cannon right, all right? But the other thing is to look from a bigger perspective. This was caused by the fact that the barrel end angle was stored as an instance variable. Because it was stored as an instance variable, I could, I could use it throughout the application and I could use it through any method. That's known as like a global variable. Uh, it, it's similar to a global variable in the sense that anything within this context can reference it. It's not really a global variable but it's global to this object which means any method can manipulate that. And you got to be careful when you do that. Um, that's why if at all possible try to keep as, as few instance variables as possible. And in that manner, you, you minimize the risk of someone or, or something accidentally referencing uh, an instance variable. Um, the best functions are ones that don't use anything from outside of it, but simply take arguments and use that. And the trouble I got into last time is because this was um, an instance variable and that messed everything up. So we should be back in business with this. So let's go and make sure we are. All right. And we have it where single touch the swipe isn't working the way I thought because the swipe also starts with a touch, so it doesn't aim doesn't shoot exactly the way that I would have thought it would.
because any of these things start with a single touch. So the single touch is processed. Here, here you can see though, once it's aimed, well, I guess it's not showing what I expected. So yeah, that was my fault in design in thinking that I could make the swipe shoot without aiming. Um, okay. That's enough on that one. Were there any questions about this? The main thing with this is gestures and um, so on. I'd like to take a little diversion um, to, to talk about some more Java concepts, all right? And the concept I want to talk about today is a concept of an interface. And when I talk about an interface, even though, you know, it sounds like it, I'm not talking about a graphical interface, uh, a GUI. I'm talking about the, the Java construct known as an interface. Does anyone know what that is, what an interface is? All right. Yeah, outside of a GUI. Okay, an interface is like this. All right. Let's say that we're designing a a system. And again, this is going to be it's going to be maybe not the most practical example, but um, I hope it illustrates the concept. If we were doing, if we had a system, and we were let's say, coming up with classes for um, animals, all right? On the top of the list, we might have a super class for animals. Because all animals share some attributes and behaviors in common. All animals do that, all right? We then could break it down and have subclasses of animals for fish, birds, or actually we could, we could break it down, put another level in there. Animals, vertebrates, and invertebrates. All right. Underneath vertebrates would have then fish, birds, mammals, and so on. Underneath invertebrates you'd have things like bugs. crawly things. I don't know. I'm not a zoologist. But we'd have other subcategories underneath that. So let's say we have this inheritance scheme in our application where birds is a subclass of vertebrates and vertebrates are a subclass of animals. Let's say elsewhere in our application we have a class for things that fly. Okay, things that fly. Well, there's things that fly alright, birds are things that fly, bats are things that fly, flying bugs are things that fly. In addition to that, airplanes fly, kites fly, um, zeppelins fly, um, rockets fly, frisbees fly, and so on. We could have created a scheme where we had as a superclass flying things. And underneath that we had birds, bugs that fly, flying bugs, bats, zeppelins, airplanes, and so on. 
But we can't do both because in Java there's only a single level of inheritance um, allowed. All right, so a class cannot have multiple uh, parent classes. All right, you can have multiple ancestor classes, but only one on each level. So birds extends vertebrates, vertebrates extends animal. A class can extend two different things. All right. How do you tell if something is good for a subclass? You apply what's called the ISA test. I-S-A. In other words, a bird is a vertebrae. Is that true? Oh yeah, it's true. A vertebrae is an animal. Yeah, that's true. A bat is a mammal. Yeah. Mammals are vertebrates? Yeah. Vertebrates are animals? Yeah. So you ask, is the superclass an example of, is, is the subclass rather, an example of the superclass? Now, with interfaces, you also have an is a test. But it's sort of a weaker is a test. In other words, birds have more things in common with vertebrates than they do with frisbees. All right. It is true that a bird's a flying thing, and so is a frisbee, and so is a kite, and so on down the line. But if you think about the behaviors that a bird has, a bird has more behaviors in common with, with other vertebrates than it does with frisbees. But there's a few key things that all flying things have in common. We could say that flying things have, for example, a maximum velocity the fastest they can fly. Every flying thing has its own maximum velocity. An airplane plane could be, you know, hundreds of miles an hour. You know, how would we figure out the maximum velocity of an airplane? Well, I don't know, but it probably would have something to do with how many engines it has, what kind of fuel it's fueled with, um, maybe what kind of engines they are, what's the weight of the plane. I'll bet you some engineer, if you gave them those factors, could write a little formula to figure out the maximum um, speed that an airplane could fly. Likewise, a bird. How fast can a bird fly? Well, that would depend on the size of the bird and the weight of the bird and the species of bird and blah, 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 a bunch of other factors. And I'll bet you if we gave a zoologist, those factors, a zoologist could probably come up with some calculation of approximately what the maximum speed of any given bird is. Now, the way that we calculate the speed of an airplane is drastically different than the way we calculate the speed of a bird. All right? Yet, for both birds and airplanes, there is a method that says, give me your maximum speed. So that's what we do when we create an interface. When we create an interface, we create sort of the shell of a class. We don't actually create any complete methods in it. And we don't have any attributes. What we have are what are called abstract methods. And the abstract methods are simply um, a method, a name, what arguments you're going to give it, and what you're going to get back. All right. So, on my flying thing interface, I may have calculate max speed that returns a double and no arguments. Another attribute that every flying thing might have is the maximum height what's the highest it can go, all right? And again, there's probably similar formulas for birds and frisbees and airplanes and all that. So maybe calculate max height would be another method. So when you define these in an interface, you don't define the details of the method. You simply state that the, anything that implements this interface is going to have one of these methods. All right? Why do we do that? We do that for polymorphism. And what do I mean by polymorphism? Well, let's say I had 
some function that was going to calculate um, the, um, you know, the, 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 that could calculate the maximum speed that something could fly for a video game, for example. I was doing a video game where there were a bunch of things that fly in it. All right. I could give that function any flying thing and then ask that flying thing, what's your maximum speed? All right. Or let's say I was writing a, a system uh, for a college and I wanted to do a mass emailing to the college. Well, the college has a lot of different folks in it, right? They have, there's individuals, there's corporations that deal with the college, uh, there are students, there's faculty, there's other employees. They may have individual classes for them, but I could say all of them are email recipients. And then I could have a get email, re email address method as part of the interface. And when I implemented that interface, I would make sure that every class that implemented that interface had that get email um, functionality on it, the function. Let me try to pull up an example here of this. Here they give an example. I don't like that example. Here they give an example of the interface being an engine. All right. Now there's a lot of different kinds of engines, and they don't like all inherit from each other. Right? It's not the case of like a gas engine isn't the same as a uh, uh, a uh, electric engine. All right. 
they define with an interface three methods, a start, a stop, and a use of fuel. All right? If we implement that, and again, we're not extending it, so we're not inheriting from it, for a petrol engine, you Yanks would call it a gasoline engine, all right, um, we would have to create methods for start, stop, and use as fuel. And sure enough, we have those. So an interface when it's implemented, what you're doing is you're promising that you're going to implement with your class that implements the interface these things. And then you can use that interface like as an argument to a function and the function knows that it will have those methods that you've defined on an interface. Now the details of how the calculation is done, just like the details of how you calculate the maximum flying speed for a bird, versus the maximum flying speed for an airplane, the details are going to be very different. All right? You're going to use the instance variable specific to the bird or to the airplane in doing the calculation. But um, the fact is, is there will be a get maximum speed method on the bird. Now an engine can, or, or an engine, a, uh, uh, an, a class can have as many interfaces as you want. And that allows you to plug it into any number of different methods. Here's an example where they're saying something that's playable has a method called play. Now what is playable? What, what are things that you can play? Well you could play a virtual musical instrument. All right. You could also play a game um, on your device against the computer. You can play your rock, paper, scissors game. You could also play an online game against an opponent. So the different things that you can play are not necessarily um, part of the same sub and super class structure. In other words, they don't inherit from each other. A musical instrument doesn't have anything to do with a game. All right? But they're all the same in the sense that you can play it. And again, if you had some sort of application that gave the user to choose what they wanted to play, as long as it implemented the playable interface, you could plug it in that function, call the play method, and then the appropriate action would start on the class. Here they give an example of tic-tac-toe. Tic-tac-toe, playing tic-tac-toe is different than playing a cards game, a card game, for example. Card games have decks of cards and, and so on. But they have in common the fact that you play them. All right. So I could have in this case, and they don't they don't uh, go into uh, this much detail, I don't think. But you could have, for example, an interface for playable things. You could have an interface for things that you do with a deck of cards, card deck things. You know, to do a card trick to do fortune or whatever. And again, you could uh, put some methods in there, like shuffle, that had to do with cards. And then everything that had cards would have to implement how you would shuffle it for that particular game. Or deal, right? Dealing blackjack is different than dealing poker, which is different than dealing solitaire, which is different than, you know, I don't know, dealing for a card trick. But you could say, have a deal method on your cards game interface and then each um, object that implemented that interface would have to have a deal method that did whatever specifically related to dealing in that case. All right? 
why have the interface? Again, so that we can plug that in to, uh, we can plug that in wherever, uh, we can plug that into anything, uh, any method. We can plug any members of that interface into that method. It effectively makes it like a component then. In other words, anything, you know, if we had a little, uh, if we created a, a, an Android game, for example, and it was a whole bunch, it was a collection of card games, all right, and we had a menu for all the different card games. And we had a button to say, go and play that game. Well, one might cr create one class. It might create a, a blackjack class. One may create a poker class. One may create a bridge class. If, the, if I know they all implement the same interface, I can call that and pass that class to their, uh, to a function. And then I can call the methods that are defined in common on the interface. So I could say play. All right. And it doesn't matter which card game got passed to it, which card game object got passed to it. Because it implements the interface, I can call the play method and it will go and it will do the methods appropriate for that kind of card game. Or I can say shuffle and it will do the shuffling for that and so on down the lines. It, it gives you the, yeah, it gives you the ability to write methods that can do similar things to very different kinds of objects. Right, so you're not restricted. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so I could give, in my hypothetical example, I could give a method, any card game, and th that method knows that there's a play method on it because it's defined in the interface and these classes implement that interface. So any one that I pass to that, I could call the play method on and I'd be able to do that. I had in my notes to talk about this. Um, I am guessing um, that we will see an example of this going forward. And when we do, I will uh, be sure to bring it up and to, to point out uh, where we have that. If you want more examples from this, again, you know, just Google Java interface example or, or look in your textbook and I'm sure it will cover um, some examples of this in more detail. All right. It's a very powerful thing. In terms of when you use interfaces versus when you use inheritance, you typically use inheritance when there's a very strong is-a relationship and you can really benefit from the fact that your classes are going to inherit the code of a method. All right. With interfaces, there is no code associated with the method. We simply say that this class is going to have one of these methods. So we don't gain any like reusability of code. So for my bird and for my uh, airplane, I'm still going to have to code a calculate maximum height function for each of them. So I don't get any reusability there because I can't. They're very different things that have different methods for calculating it. But I do gain the knowledge that if I pass a flying thing object, all right, uh, or an object that in, uh, uh, implements uh, the flying things interface to a method, that it will have some calculate maximum speed, calculate maximum height method. So if you do end up having to change the code down the road, You would only have to change every. You'd only have to change every class if you changed an interface. If you added a new method, so for example, if if we do some research to get a better idea of how fast birds can fly, for example, and we refine that, 
um, we would have to go and change that method or, or with, with uh, engines. You only, but given that there's no code in the interface, the only way we would have to change all the objects that implement that interface is if we added a new method, if we took away a method, if we change the arguments or return values to a certain method. So that's really the only time that we'd have to do that. It doesn't give you the benefits of reusing code. It, it gives you, and again, sometimes they call it like a contract. If you implement an interface, you're promising to have functions, have these functions available. So then it can be passed to any function that uses that and that function can know that it, it, it has this method, this method, and that method. Yes? I, I think that answers my question. I was just going to ask that every class that implements has to have every... Has to have every method that's defined in the interface. Okay, so like class in the game thing. Right. You could use just three of them in this class. Correct. You promise that you're going to implement all of them in there, all right? But again, the advantage is, is that I can, you know, like if, if you think of, of poker, for example, that is a playable thing, so it could implement the play interface. It is dealing with cards, so it could in implement the deck interface. You could have multi, it, it is a form of gambling, so you could implement the gambling interface, all right? So one class can implement a bunch of inter interfaces, whereas when you have the inheritance structure, a class can only extend one superclass. All right. So real powerful thing, and um, going forward, we, I'm pretty sure we do see some examples of it, and, and I'll, I'll point them out when we do, or if not, I'll have to come up with, uh, with an example that illustrates this. All right. Next thing we have is another little game. And let's go and fire this up. It's a spot on game. I did not want to do that. Okay. First modification I'm going to do is like give us like 10 minutes worth of time so I don't have to rush from unplugging this. All right. These things pop up on the screen. And you got to tap them. And I think if they go through their life cycle and they disappear, you get points off. So, like, let's hit that one. Then as it travels, if they disappear, oops, looks like we get 20 for the red, 10 for the green, and I believe if they disappear, we get points off. Oh no, we lose a life, that's right. Oh, we get points off if we swing and miss all together. That's it. All right, so let's review it. We have three lives. If a thingy disappears, we lose a life. The red are worth 20, the green are worth 10, and if we hit the white area, we get some points off. So there, 20 points, 
30, 40. If I swing and a miss, I get points off. All right. And we go until we have three lives gone. All right. So let's look at this and see what we have. Nothing to see in the manifest file. Actually, one thing to see in the manifest file. All right. And that is that we have set uh, for landscape. So no matter what, this is going to be in landscape mode, um, regardless of how we have it oriented. The other thing that's interesting is hardware accelerated equals true. That relates to using hardware acceleration to improve the, the, the drawing um, of the graphics to make it do um, quicker. There's a little narration about that. Hardware acceleration is not support for all 2D drawing operations. Turning it on might affect some of your custom views. Problems usually manifest themselves as invisible elements, exceptions, or wrongly rendered pixels. But because of the increased resources to enable hardware, your, your app will consume more RAM. And I'm guessing it probably would, would uh, consume more um, uh, power resources as well. But we can do that. All right, we are enabling hardware acceleration for this because this is more of a graphic sort of game. All right, our values, our strings, nothing earth shattering there. We have again some audio files, uh, a sound that plays when we hit a sound that plays when we miss and a sound that plays when one of the little guys disappears. The layout, we have a main XML that really if we look at it, relative layout, which means we position things in relation to other things. We have a text view for the high score, a text view for this score, this attempt. Actually, ah, my mistake. A text for the high score, a text for the level that we're on, if we look here, there's the high score, there's the level that we're on. Then we have a score for this round, and then we have our three lives. Which are here. So that's our layout. As this is a relative view, we position things uh, with relation to other things. 
So we say, for example, that that text view for high score is sort of our starting point. The text view for the levels is to the right of the high score, and the text view for our current score is below the text view. Oh, I'm sorry. Text view for the high score is sort of the starting point. The level that we're on is to the right of the high score. Our current score is underneath the high score. And then we have these, um, the, the three little things that say how many lights we have left at the bottom. We then have a life XML, and oops, we have an untouched life XML, or untouched XML. The life XML corresponds to these guys down here. Boom, boom, boom. The untouched, and if you notice, there's no well, if you notice, the source of this is drawable life, which is actually this little guy here. All right. The untouched one, notice there is no source associated with that. So I don't specify what image is associated with the untouched lives, which are the little guys that are floating around the screen. Why is there no image associated with this guy? All right. This untouched XML becomes these guys. Why is there no image file associated with those guys? Well, let's look. Actually, it's one of two image files, right? It's either a red guy or a green guy. So programmatically, we're setting the image associated with that image view. So. The three guys on the bottom of the screen, <clears throat> all right, they're just represented as green guys, so we have an icon associated with them, or we have an image associated with them. Whereas the actual playable guys, the guys that fly around the screen, we don't have an image source associated with it. We're going to assign that programmatically. Presumably half the time we're going to make them red, half the time we're going to make them uh, green. We, we, you know, we certainly could change that rule, but again, that, that's what we're doing. Not this game. I, I mean, it's not going to know. You know, I mean, yeah, two people can sit there, and we could sit side by side and, you know, assume this is one person's hand, this is another person's hand. But it's not keeping track of. Yeah, I could. We could alter it to do that. Sure. <laughs> well, maybe we'll do that. That's a, that's a good thought. You could, you could easily do that. Um, in which case, you'd probably make the score of those. You, you'd probably have two ending. Th that would complicate a little bit because you'd have two ending. Of course, you could play it for a certain amount of time only. Um, you wouldn't know who missed. That's the, pro that's the flaw with it. In other words, as these things went, okay, okay, then yeah, we could do it then. All right, so let's look at our spot on 
And if we notice, there's almost no code here. All right. Why not? Well, again, this is the boss. The boss themselves doesn't necessarily do the work. This is the, the class for the activity. This sort of controls things. But it doesn't actually do the functionality it, it itself. So we notice that in the canon game, and we're going to notice that here too. That we're going to have a class to get things rolling, sort of manage things, and then we're going to have a class that actually does the views actually going to do the game stuff in it. So here, in this activity, we extend activity, so that's inheritance, which means we inherit the code from all those other classes that are parents of it. We set our main content view. We find the relative layout. Yeah, go ahead. Capital R? Resources. Yep. So in other words, R layout main would mean in the resources layout main. So yeah, that's what the R, the capital R means. Okay. We point to this relative layout. We find view by ID relative layout. So we find the relative layout. We then create a new view, a new spot on view, and pass it the layout. And then we add that view to our layout. Okay, that's a little bit confusing here, but essentially what they're doing here is they are, if we noticed, if we looked at our main XML, our main XML has stuff for this, 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 and this. It doesn't have this playing field in it. All right. That's what we're doing here. We're, we're effectively adding the playing field, which is the spot on view. So when we add the spot on view in, that's when we actually set that big giant area in the middle that we're actually doing the game stuff on. All right. Really not anything else. All right. Let's look at the view then. Most of the action like we did happen before uh works on the the view. All right, we do some things here. We have some instance variables for stuff that we're going to use for the game. We are storing, we have some of these constants that we can use so that we can easily change things. What is the shared preferences again? What does that do? What does that enable us to do? I'll give you a hint. Yeah, in this case it's used for the highest score, right. The shared preferences allows us to do a little bit of persistent storage. 
So in other words, my high score on this game is 155. If I turn this guy off, if I first find the switch, and then I turn this guy off, and then I turn it back on, it's still going to remember my highest score was 155. Why? Because that shared preferences is a sort of persistent storage. All right? It's a way to store some just simple pieces of information. In other words, the high score is not, you know, to store the high score doesn't require a relational database. We're just storing that one thing. So we're storing it in a shared preference file. And then we can go and we can look for high score in our preferences. If it's the very first time we've played this game and there is no high score, we simply then use a value of zero as the high score. All right. So that's what we're doing up to here. We're creating a layout inflator. We're going to do that because we're going to um, add stuff to our layout. We have lines that look a lot like the lines that we've typically seen, but we're looking at this variable called relative layout. What does that mean? Well, we have our layout. The activity has its main layout, which comes from main.xml. We add to that main layout sort of our game screen, which is a spot on, we call it spot on view. The spot on view is a child of the main layout. All right. What's on the main layout? Well, the maximum scores on the main layout. Our current score is on the layout. What level we're on is on the layout. How many lives we have left is on the layout. These are all things that are on the main view. We're going to need, however, code on our child view, that spot on view, that points to things on its parent. Therefore, what we do is we find those things using find view by ID, except we don't do it for the main view. We do it for this relative layout, which is the parent layout, which we passed in the constructor. All right. So if let's look back here on this constructor where we create that new spot on view. We pass it this. We pass it the layout. All right. We pass the layout, the main parent layout that holds everything. In the constructor here, then, we use that parent layout, all right, to, so the child layout can point to the things on the parent. We then create a spot handler, which is going to handle when the spots get put on the screen and so on. On size change, again, which if you remember, fires off when the activity first starts, we calculate how big the, the screen is. We have cancel animation, which we'll look at later on. And let's see. Eventually, we have our code that starts a new game.
that occurs on resume. First thing we do is we clear out the list of spots. Okay, let's look at what spots is. Spots in this example is Where's the declaration of that? Ah, here we go. It is a queue. What is a queue? Today might be British Language Day here because we use petrol and now we're talking about queues. What is a queue? Queue's a line, all right? What is the defining characteristic of a line? It's straight, okay. It, the elements in a row. Think of a think of a line at a grocery store. All right. What is true about the mem the, 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 the customers in the in the line? Yeah. That's true. All right, the arrival rate. <laughs> Yeah, or you, we, we could have went grocery shopping for, for 10 minutes and, and probably learned it too. That's, that's funny. Um, but which customer gets waited on first? First one in line, right? So the earlier you get in line, the earlier you're going to get waited on. That actually is, in, in accounting terms, in accounting, the similar concept is called FIFO, first in, first out. So in other words, the first person in the line, if I get put in the line first and then someone's behind me and someone gets behind me, that's the order that they're going to get put in. All right. So you get added. Uh, the, the characteristics of a queue from a data per, uh, structure perspective is that you don't get added at a certain place in a queue. You always get added to the end of the queue. So if I have a method to add, the method to add someone to the queue doesn't say add them in position 5 or add them in position one, or add them in position whatever. It adds them to the nth position, right? So if there are 10 people in line, person zero through nine, it will add them to position n, which is 10. <laughs> yeah, the corollary to that, yeah, we won't talk about that. that that's more of a philosophy question, I think, than a, a data structure. Uh, the flip side of that equation is when people leave the queue, they leave, you know, if I say we process someone from this queue, we don't have to say which person we process. We know it's always the person at the head of the line. So the, the, the grocery clerk finishes someone and boom, you know, checks them out. So they go out of the line. Everyone else moves forward one. But we don't have to ask who got waited on. We know it's that person that's in that first position. It's not like the cashier is going to go and check out the fifth person in line or something like that. So a queue is simply a, a data structure where all ads happen at the end, all drops or, or, or what would you say, all, all deletes happen at the beginning, all right, and first in, first out. As someone gets deleted, everyone in the queue moves up a space. So. Both, the, there's, there's two cues in here. So I guess that's the difference. What I wanted to explain is the difference between a queue and an array, right? Because you might say, well, why don't they have an array of spots? Well, they don't have an array of spots because 
Um, we want a very um, linear process of the first spot that appears is the first spot that disappears. The first, uh, then, uh, then, uh, the, then a new spot's added, it will be the last one. It, it will, it'll, it'll disappear after all the other ones have disappeared. Now you could write the game a different way, but they didn't. And I'm kind of glad they didn't because this gives us a chance to talk about that queue data structure. So we have two of these queue data structures. We have one for the spot itself, all right, and it contains an image view. All right, it's, it's effectively like an array, except it's a special kind of an array. It's a queue. I'm sure if we looked at the inheritance structure, a queue inherits from blah, blah, blah. All right. It's an image view. So this is going to hold the spots. It's going to hold the little green guys and the little red guys. What's the animator of those spots controlling? Their, their, their movement and the fact that they get smaller. If you, if you look at this, again, when a spot appears, not only do they move, but they get smaller. So that was the first guy, so that's going to be the first to disappear. All right. Okay. So the animator controls that behavior. And these, of course, they go hand in hand. Each spot has an animator associated with it. And I'm sure within some parameters, there's randomization of where it's going to appear on the screen and, and what direction it's going to go and how fast it's going to go and so on. At any rate, First thing we do to both of these queues is clear them out. All right. So clearing out the queue is like you know what happens when uh, the 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 cashier goes on break. You just boot everyone out of the line. All right. So when we start, we start with a fresh spots and animator queue. We also then. remove all the views, the old lives left from the screen. So we get rid of those three spots on the screen. Why do we get rid of those? By lives I mean these guys. <coughs> these three guys here. When we go and reset, what this is saying is, the first thing we do is remove all the lives that were left over. Why do we do that? Well, so we can just add three, right? If there were two lives left over from the previous game, all right, actually that doesn't hold true. Well, they do it anyhow. That way they know that they're going to start with a clean slate with the lives and they could add as many as they want to. All right, we initialize the initial animation length. One thing you notice in this game is the longer it goes on, the faster these guys move. We set the no we initialize some other variables. Game over is false. Display the scare uh, scores. Add lives. So we got rid of all the lives. Now we're adding three or however many lives we define using that layout inflator of life. Remember that layout inflator was the little green guy, all right, that comes from drawable life. <coughs> then we add new spots on the screen at intervals. In other words, when this starts, we don't have 
boom, 10 spots on the screen at once. We have one little period of time later, we get the second and the third and the fourth and so on. This is the runnable that's added to new, add a new spot. Every time we call the run, we go and add a new spot, which effectively randomly finds a spot for the, 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 the thing. And it goes and creates the spot. It adds it to the queue. Sets the initial parameters. Then effectively flips a coin and decides whether it's going to be a green spot or a red spot. All right. It does a random thing. If it gets a zero, it's green. If it gets something other than zero, it will get um, a red spot. We set some coordinates for it. We set an on-spot listener for it. We do this as an anonymous class, and we simply say, hey, when that spot gets hit, call the touch spot method and tell them which spot got hit. Uh huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's a Java, that's a Java um, method. And what this will do is this will give you a 0 or a 1. All right? Correct. So we, you know, so through this we could tilt the proportion of, like, um, if you wanted more green than red or if you wanted more red than green. All right. So we set the click listener. We add that spot to the view, and then we set the animate. Now, if you notice, this is a different way of doing animation than we've done before. We're not doing animation via an XML file. We're doing animation based on God knows what. All right? This is a long string of m methods, all right? And we'll pick up on, next, uh, on this next time because in, in a case of perfect timing, it is 6.30 now, and this will be a long one to go over because th it, this is sort of confusing how this works. When you hear about it, it makes sense, and it's actually kind of elegant, but the code looks very clunky by having um, object.method other method, dot other method, dot other method. So we're just chaining methods together and we'll see how that works um, next time. And then we'll con uh, continue. All right.